Um, with the snow this morning, it's a bit depressing, so I thought I'd bring you back to a time where it probably didn't snow as much. Um, although maybe, I'll maybe convince you that it was not as hot as we thought. Um, so basically I'm going to talk about the early Earth. Uh, so very, this first period of uh, crustal formation. And I want to look at really the primitive crust. How did the first crust form? When and how? And this is where I want to bring you uh, this morning for, for this talk. So I'd like to start with a, just a simple geological time scale, just to put everything in a time perspective. Uh, from the accretion of the Earth, 4.567 billion years old. Now we think it's 568, but it doesn't really matter to today. And um, the word Hadean actually comes from this guy here, Hades, who was the Greek god of, a, of the underworld, or hell, because basically the Hadean was defined as the absence of rock records. So we don't have anything to work with. Rocks were not preserved for almost 600 million years. Um, it's not exactly true anymore. We have a few samples uh, that are preserved from this time. And these are the only samples we can use to understand what happened during this long, during this long early period uh, in Haiti and for almost 600 million years, like I said. And this is what we have to work with. This is all we have. Um, I will try to convince you by the end of this talk that now we have something else right here also. Uh, so it's great to understand what's going on in this period. But now uh, let's focus on these. These are the two only samples we have, Hadean samples. So the Acasta Nice here in the Northwest Territory. Um, they're really deformed uh, felsic gneisses, uh, dated at around four billion years old, so right at the edge between the Hadean and the Archean. This boundary is kind of fuzzy. It changes a bit. You'll read 3.8 billion years old. Sometimes you'll read four. We're trying to uh, be more precise and set it, uh, but there's a bit of debate. Um, but anyway, a cast and ice here, four billion years old. And some cores are actually a bit older, 4.2 billion years old. Um, it's a small outcrop there of uh, felsic uh, nice, it's very deformed. But most of what we know about the early Earth, or basically the Hadean, is from the Jackal Zircon. So I don't know if you've heard about the Jackal Zircons, but the Jackals are uh, actually um, in Western Australia, uh, they're um, uh, conglomerates. And we can find the Tridal Zircons in conglomerate deposit way younger. So the conglomerates are about three billion years old. But inside, you, we found, uh, we can find Zircon as old as 4.4 billion years old. But there's a huge population of zircons, Hadean, the, the probably the, uh, the, uh, the uh, mean po or the mode population is around 4.1 billion years old. But we have some grains that are as old as 4.4 billion years old. Except for these two uh, terrains, all we have starts at 3.8 billion years old. This is when we start to have crust to study in Greenland, in China, in Antarctica, in Labrador. But it leaves us with almost 700 million years with almost nothing. So it's very hard for us geologists to go and understand what was going on at that time if we don't have geological record. So most of what we know is based on this or modelization, just models. Um, even if we don't have a lot, the Jackal zircons tell us, they can tell us a lot about what was going on in the Hadean. And these zircons have been widely studied. Um, all the spiffy isotopes you can think of people are looking at them, because this is all we have. So like I said, they are from a conglomerate, so it's a detrital sediment. And the important thing is we don't have the whole rock. So the rock in which the zircon crystallized is gone. It's eroded away. And now we only have the grains. And this is uh, just a, an histogram of the population. You can see that most of the grains are actually 4.1 to 4.2 billion years old. We have a small population, 4.3. Basically, one grain, one spot at 4.4 billion years old. One grain, one spot. But anyhow, it is there. They are the oldest mineral on Earth. Um, and that's giving us evidence for at least 4.4 to 4.3 billion years old crust. So basically, what I want to do here is build, despite the fact that we don't have a lot of sample, what do we know about the early crust? About the first primitive crust that formed right after probably the moon the giant moon forming impact. So geochronology, we need to have crust at 4.4 billion years old because we have zircon, one zircon, but zircon is between 4.3 and 4.4 billion years old. They have to crystallize in a rock somewhere. 
So that gives us a time constraint. Um, what can we tell about the composition of this primitive crust? Well, this is for uh, all my Ignis Petrology students who may or may not be here. But just for a simple phase diagram, all in being CPX and quartz, you know that if you melt the mantle, the mantle <coughs> composition, the first magma you form, so the first crust you will form, it's going to be here. It's going to be a basalt or a basaltic composition, more or less. The problem with that is basaltic composition or basalt most likely don't have zircon. So we're stuck, because this is the, the thing we want to study, really the first crust, the first primitive mafic crust, but we don't have zircon in them. So to form zircons, we need to form a primitive crust here and remelt it. So it's going to remelt here to form felsic magmas in which you can actually crystallize zircons and then have this time capsule. So it is great we have zircons, but they're actually second stage process. We have to melt primitive crust, while the mantle to form the primitive crust, then remelt it to form a granite and form zircon. But what I'd like to do is to get to the first stage here. But still, so mafic in composition for the primitive crust, 4.3 to 4.4 billion years old. Um, what can we tell about geodynamics? Basically, we start to recycle this primitive crust. This is again the Jack Hill zircons, this is hafnium isotopic composition, this is time. So basically this is a nice study done by uh, Tony Kept in 2012 uh, and 2010 and basically he actually selected the least disturbed, the least altered zircon from the huge uh, Jack Hills populations and when you calculate or you, you analyze their initial isotopic composition in hafnium, this is the trend they define here. And this trend gives you lithium hafnium ratio of 0 0.02. This 0 0.02 is typical of mafic crust. Felsic crust would be like this, much lower lutetium afnum ratio. So what this tells you is that these zircons crystallize in a granite or a TTG or a felsic rock, but this felsic rock was formed from the melting of a older, an older mafic precursor consistent with something mafic 4.5, 4.4 billion years old with that evolution here. And we start to recycle it and remelt it and remelt it over 500 million years. So a lot of recycling going on. First crust, basaltic crust, 4.4 billion years old, and the recycling of this primitive crust to form these younger felsic rocks that have zircons in here. Um, they also tell us something about the environment, uh, the environmental conditions. Uh, it's pretty well known that most of these zircons, not most, but a certain amount of these zircons, they have high delta O18 values. And the only way you can actually do that is with alteration. So they're formed from the melting of a basaltic crust, but that crust has to have seen water. So there's water interaction here. Uh, so at the surface, basically this primitive crust was altered with liquid water already at, maybe not at 4.4 because this grain doesn't have the delta O18, the high values, but we start to see it at 4.3 billion years old. So you need an hydrosphere, 4.3 billion years old, to alter the primitive crust and then remelt it to form all these zircons. So now I'm trying to build this, this environment, I'm trying to build what was this first crust just based on the Jack Hill zircon. So mafic crust, 4.4 to 4.3 billion years old, interaction with hydrosphere already at that time, 4.3 billion years old. So now, I want to bring you to this place here. It's called the Nouagatuk Greenstone Belt. It's a small greenstone belt in uh, northern Quebec in the Superior Province, just on the shore of Hudson Bay here. This is a zoom. This is the Hudson Bay. It's from the Hudson Bay terrain. The Hudson Bay terrain is slightly younger. It's slightly older than the Riviera No terrain. Older model ages, so it basically seems to be one of the core, the oldest, one of the oldest core of the north, uh, eastern Superior Province. And this belt is right here. On the shore. Um, this is an air photo, what it looks like, so a lot of rocks to work with. Um, and I've been studying that belt for, for, for quite a few, for quite a long time now. Um, and what I would like to do is to convince you that this part here is probably the first crust that formed after the moon forming, forming impact. So this is a preserved remnant, a preserved piece of this primitive first stage crust on the earth. Not only zircons, not only detrital sediments, but we have now a piece of it. Um, a bit of geology. What is that belt? 
basically, it's not that big, it's probably three kilometers by three kilometers, <coughs> about 10 square kilometers. Uh, a lot of exposure, but dominated by mafic rocks. Um, and surrounded in white here, you have all the TTGs, so the rocks from the Tone Electron Gemite Granodiorite series. So all the felsic rock, uh, younger felsic rock uh, surrounding it, but most of the, uh, the, uh, the lithologies here are mafic. So we have these, uh, what I call greenstone, they're classic uh, actinolite, uh, green schist, phase schist volcanic rocks. Uh, ultra mafic sills that are actually mainly olivine cumulates. Um, um, all the gray here is uh, gabbro silts, so <coughs> broic again, so gabbro silts, cross cutting uh, this main lithology, I'll, I'll come back on this main lithology, just the next slide. And uh, so mainly uh, mafic, but also with chemical sediment. Bend and iron formation, so I don't know if you can see, but it's the orange line here. So you can follow the bend and iron formation all the way down. It's actually a stratigraphic marker. We kind of lose it here in the swamp in the water, but we pick it up here, and it seems to grade into that massive quartzite. It seems to be uh, just a silica facies of the chemical sediment. It's sort of a, sort of a chert, but it's highly recrystallized now. So chemical sediment, mafic rocks, and it's all surrounded by this white here on the map, uh, tonalite, trongemite, so the classic TTG series from from uh, from the Superior product. But again dominated by mafic rock, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for a basaltic primitive crust. The dominant lithology is this, this light green here. It's a unit, because it's very variable in mineralogy, that we call the Ojarolik unit. It's a package of rock, that's why it has a unit name, and it's an amphibolite, where the mineralogy varies from biotite rich to comintonite rich, but basically it's always the same kind of assemblage, it's composed of comintonite, plagioclase, biotite, plus garnet, or plus or minus garnet. As you can see on these pictures, garnet is actually quite dominant. Sometimes you have absolutely no garnet, so almost pure comintonite. But anyhow, it's a very, very homogeneous package of rock in itself. And in, inside this package of rock, it can be quite heterogeneous based on the mineralogy, but always the same kind of mineralogy. Proportions are just, or just, uh, there's a bit of variation in proportion of it. But this, um, Ujaralic unit is dominant lithology, and this is where I'm going to spend most of my time for the rest of this talk here, trying to convince you that this thing, this rock, is a piece of primitive crust. Uh, this is just for, if you don't remember your mineralogy courses, coming tonight. Coming tonight is an amphibole, but it's an amphibole that's poor in calcium, so very calcium poor and magnesium rich in the coming tonight Grunerite series. So all these rocks are amphibolite, but calcium poor and magnesium rich amphibolites. That's why you don't have the typical hornblende you will find in a in typical greenstone belt in the, in the superior rock. So very light in color like this, because of the biotite and comictonite is uh, beige. That's why it looks really unusual. But chemically, it's not that unusual. They're basaltic rocks. Um, we can define three distinct geochemical groups when you look at the chemistry in more detail. Basically two groups. One group that is high titanium here, this is zirconium against titanium. So one group that is high titanium, one group that is low titanium. But this low titanium group is further subdivided into two groups. And mainly, the best way of seeing these three groups is the aluminum titanium <coughs> ratio. We have very distinct aluminum titanium ratio. The high titanium rocks here, the low titanium group, defining these two groups uh, having distinct aluminum titanium ratio. I will call this the enriched group, this the depleted one. You'll see a bit later, it's just based on the total concentration of incompatible trace elements. These guys have more, these guys are slightly more depleted, but they're all from this uh, low titanium group. Major elements, they're basically basalt. There is a bit of variation from the high titanium groups, mainly basaltic in composition. <coughs> when you go to the low titanium group, it's a bit more evolved, basaltic andesite, maybe a few andesite, but basically basaltic, basaltic andesite, mafic rocks here. Uh, the trace elements, you see the same exact three groups in uh, trace element space. So these are rare element profile uh, for the three groups. So high titanium here, what I call the depleted low titanium and the enriched low titanium, just because of the degree of enrichment in, in both series. And what's really interesting is that they actually follow a chemostratigraphy. So there is a chemical stratigraphy in the belt, 
I can give you a rock from here, here, and there. You can tell the difference. Um, but they, on the chemistry, you can. Rarest profile are really distinct, but they follow, like I said, a very, very precise chemical stratigraphy, where at the base of the sequence, you have the high titanium rock, so the pale green here. So this is a thin form like this, that is refolded like this. So these high titanium rocks here, chemical sediment, now an all in yellow here, so the chemical sediment gets you to the deformation, so it's a very tight thin form here, refolded like that. So right above the chemical sediment, you have these depleted low titanium rocks. They have this typical U-shaped profile here for rare earth elements. And above these, at the core here, this, this uh, darker green, you have these enriched low titanium, so enriched in light rare earth element, and pretty much flat heavy rare earth element. So three groups, and I won't go into all the details, but they seem to follow different fractionation trends. So these ones, the low titanium are basaltic in composition. Like I'll show you a bit later, they have affinities that are toleites, toleitic affinities, fractionation under dry condition. So these basic classic toleite, and then we get to more evolved rock, basaltic andesite to andesite, and we start to see that these rocks are actually showing signs of fractionation under water pressure. Um, so these rocks, they look like boninites, and these rocks, they actually have calcacon affinities. Uh, if you just like, if you just look at the rare earth profile, this could be a, a, a copy of any normal calcacon rock. And these uh, are boninites. So if you're not familiar with boninites, let's say they're high magnesium andesite, typical of a subduction zone, and they have, they're characterized by this U-shaped profile here. So chemical stratigraphy. Uh, three groups, and when you look, again, these are all the, the trace elements, not just the, the rare earth, but all the trace elements. They seem to have the signature that we can actually uh, 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 put in their tectonic context. So these are tholiates, and boninites and calcite and rocks are actually formed in subduction environment. So in a few slides I will try to convince you that these rocks are 4.4 billion years old. So what I'm saying here is 4.4 billion years old subduction. Maybe not, but still, if you look at the chemical characteristic of these rocks, they look like rocks formed in subduction zone. So the huge tantalum niobium anomaly here, this U-shaped profile characteristic of the uh, boninite, and these look like calcium rocks. Uh, they have all the geochemical characteristics. So keep that in mind. We have subduction already 4.3 or 4.4 billion years old. But anyhow, it's three different contexts, fractionation under dry condition, and elevated water pressure here. So maybe subduction. Um, it's actually remarkable how this series, and even the stratigraphy, the toleite, the boninite, the calcalcan rock salt, all of this is, there are, the, this author is a paper that came out done a long time ago, turned it all in 20, 2014. So actually compare the stratigraphy here that I just talked about, with the classical stratigraphy of a subduction zone, this is uh, just uh, the, uh, the stratigraphy of the uh, Izuban and Mariana arc, so subduction, subduction zone right here in the Pacific, and they follow the exact same chemical stratigraphy where you have four arc basalts here, pretty much tholeitic in composition, boninites, and then arc lavas, or the calcacone lava. So this is a modern example of subduction and follow exactly the same chemical stratigraphy. This is why we can ask yourself, is it really subduction in the Hadean? Turns out that there's probably other ways of doing this. Water is probably controlling a lot of that. But still, it's, it's striking how the resemblance between uh, modern subduction zone rocks or the stratigraphy or the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the stratigraphy in modern subduction <coughs> zones and uh, these rocks, 4.4 uh, billion years old. So now geochronology, I'm saying 4.4 billion years old, but I have to prove it to you, just don't take my word for it. Um, zircon chronology, the great thing with zircons is great for geochronology, the bad thing with zircons, you need felsic rocks. And like I said, I want to focus on mafic rocks. But anyhow, we have a few felsic rocks here. Most of these zircons chronology are coming from these trongemite thin intrusion. And you find these trongemite basically right here, that's it. Nowhere else. So the only zircon chronology we can use to impose geochronological constraint on the rest of the belt, they all come from 
Nelkrupa is probably 100 square meter. But anyway, intrusive rocks, <coughs> you have these intrusions here of felsic tronchomite, and they all give an age of around 3.8 billion years old. So if you read a bit on the literature of this place, you'll see that there's an age debate. Uh, some people, like me, think it's 4.4 billion years old. Some other people uh, believe uh, they're pushing, it's actually a bit younger, 3.8 billion years old. It's basically based on the only zircons, uh, the oldest zircons we can date by uranium lead, giving an age of 3.8 billion years old. But to me, this is an intrusion. So it only gives a minimum age for the mafic rock. Doesn't mean that these rocks are not older. And I'll try to prove you that they're actually much older. So intrusion, 3.8 billion years old. <coughs> so this is what I'm fighting against. Um, zircons are great. You need felsic rocks. When you don't have felsic rocks, you're, you're in big trouble. Uh, especially when you work in the Archean or old rocks. So all the classical <coughs> neodymium, samarium, and all rubidium, strontium, forget about it. But we have much less uh, geochronological tools to uh, study old, deformed, multi-deformed uh, mafic rocks. But we'll try it anyway. So like I told you before, we have other intrusions. So these gabbros here, uh, I have five minutes. So these gabbros here, basically they define a very nice uh, Isaac around 4.1 billion years old. Neodymium and Samarium Isaac around 4.1 billion years old. Again, giving a minimum age for the, uh, the, uh, the mafic rocks, the Ojara lacunae. What I'm gonna use here, uh, quicker than I thought I would, it's the short-lived isotope, so I'll try to be short-lived right here. So basically, I'm using 142 neodymium. 142 neodymium is coming from the decay of 146 samarium, half-life 100 million years. So basically, this chronometer is dead after 5 million years. So you can only date parent-daughter fractionation between 4.5 billion years old and 4 billion years old. Um, so that's what we do. So again, this is just to illustrate that if you have a differentiation event, before 500 million years, you will form rocks that have a non-zero value here because this is just the normalization with a standard. By definition, it's zero. So if you have parent-daughter fractionation before 500 million years, you'll form positive and negative values. If you have fractionation at 500 million years and later, uh, everything is zero. Everything is equal to modern mon mantle, modern, mo uh, modern rocks. When you look at the Ujaralik unit, it goes from minus 18 to plus 8, 26 ppm variation, and a good number of them have deficit in 142 Nm. The only thing, you, the only way you can do that, you need parent-daughter fractionation before 4 billion years old. It's the only way you can do that. Not only this, a key factor in this data set is that the 142 Nm data correlates with the parent-daughter ratio, so you can build an isochrome. The same way we know the age of the CAI, so the age of the Earth, using aluminum 26 and magnesium 26, we can do the same kind of work here, and the, the, the slope of this line will give you an age going younger that way here. Here it's extinct. But basically, when you do this, because you have these nice correlation in all three groups, the age you get 4.3 to 4.4 billion years old. That's why we think these rocks are as old as this. Um, all of this package 4.1, 4.3, 4.4, 4 .4. but now. We have to do something with this package. It'll start to be recycled. It is surrounded by a series of TTGs here, much younger. So 3.6, 3.8, 3.5, 3.3, 3 .3, and even surrounding the belt. This is the belt. You have, uh, we have a New York Kim TTGs, 2.7 to 2.8 billion years old. So we decided to look at these rocks because if you start to melt the primitive mafic crust, you form felsic TTGs. And we still have this Hadean signature in it. They don't correlate. These are all the TTGs. These are the mafic rocks here. There's no correlation. Basically, what you do is you take the mafic rock here, you melt it after the isotope is extinct. So you can only move this way. You won't change the 142 like that way. You only change the parent daughter ratio. But by taking this and melting it, you form felsic rocks right here. And the only way you can have that negative value is by melting something much older. Something that was formed before 4 billion years old. Um, zircons and TTGs again, you, we see the same thing in epsilon hafnium. So all of these are epsilon hafnium or a hafnium isotopic composition of zircons out of these TTGs. Basically, this is the, the trend they follow. 
this is the jack hills here. This is the castanites. All the rest, it's all from the Nuwagatu belt. All these 3.8 to 3.3 billion years old rocks. And if you see, they're totally consistent. This trend is totally consistent with mafic rock. So the lutetium aphium ratio of these rocks tells us that they are from the melting of an older mafic precursor and crosses here right at 4.4 billion years. So we have mafic crust forming here, and then we have to wait for 500 million years to start to recycle it. So we have a huge gap here that can tell us probably something in the tectonic setting change, because we have to wait 500 million years to start to produce felsic magnets. And this is what we see in the zircon record. We have jackals, casta, that's it. It's only at 3.8 billion years old that we start to have other TTGs with zircon. So what that tells me is that the mafic crust, the primitive crust, it took a long time for it to be recycled. Otherwise, we would find more jackals, we would find more casta. We don't have them just because I think felsic production, production of felsic magma was not a major significant uh, process during almost 700 million years. <clears throat> uh, just to wrap it up, now environment. We have BIFs, pillow lavas, the water, liquid water at the surface. It changes our idea of the Hadean. We have uh, rocks that are actually consistent with seawater alteration. There are cordurite and tophilite rocks here, and they're low calcium, high magnesium, and they have all the geochemical characteristics what you find in VMS, so like hydrothermal alteration of oceanic floor. We have these rocks also, even oxygen data, elevated delta O18, and they overlap with altered basalt. So we have Hadean, mafic crust, altered, remelt, recycling. So it's exactly what we see with real rocks that we saw with the jackal zircon. So this is just my conclusions, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish with that. The key point is, I think we have now real rocks to study the, uh, the Hadean. They show exactly the same thing we see in the jackal zircon and the tribal zircon. Hydrothermally altered mafic Hadean crust, 4.4 billion years old. It starts to be reworked and recycled over 500 million years um, of Earth history. So final thought, Hadean, this hellish world, well, maybe not so much. It's probably way cooler, liquid water at the surface, and maybe even uh, modern style plate tectonics uh, like subduction zone. So I'm done here. This is just my advertisement because I'm a room full of students. Um, I'm doing the same kind of work in Northern Labrador in this place, Sag Lake Ebron in Northern Labrador. So if you're interested, petrology, geochemistry, isotopes, uh, all these isotopes here, looks like a great place to go. We'll go in the summer uh, in the field. If you're looking for a PhD project, come and talk to me over lunchtime. Thank you. We have time for probably one, one question. So there's these nifty little microphones. Hi. So the uh, the competing model for is sort of like the office in their hand is the mantle drift kind of thing. Does your data support or refute either one of those? Can you get recycling in a mantle drift scenario? Yep. The only, the only thing you need is to bring water down with fractionation underwater. Either a subducting plate or mantle drift, or actually, you know, you have a pile of basalt and delamination, so vertical tectonics, so you can just delaminate a pile of basalt. And I thought actually the base of this pile of basalt would be pretty dry. Uh, so even if it, if it delaminates, it won't dehydrate to induce what melting, but apparently it's not as, as dry as this, uh, if you believe Jean Bedard, for example. So he has all these models. So basically all you need is to take a hydrated piece of basaltic rock to expel this water and then form subduction-like signatures. That's all we need. Just stop. Yeah. So right now that's a very critical age is this uh, uh, Samarium uh, Millennium Rock was to this mm -hmm. age. That's only it, I guess, for the 4.4. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't have zircons. We're yeah, looking yeah, for zircons. Yeah. We yeah, don't yeah, have yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, uh, but uh, other, there's a, also 147, 147, that also gives us some 4.4? 4.1. 4.1. 
If you look at the, the, the dominant lithology and you look at the 143 neodymium, it's all uh, reset at, at 2.7. Between two, it's all consistent with so New York. Then the that's the question began. Why that the uh, 147-144 was reset, but uh, why did 146-142 <coughs> was not reset? Because it's dead. Because you can only change the thermium neodymium ratio. Yes. So basically you yeah, have all the scatter on this isochrome is resetting, it's moving the thermium neodymium ratio. Yeah. So it gives you scatter on the isochrome. But you are saying the metamorphism, you write the metamorphism, yeah. reset over isochrome. Isotopes, the 147, so you, you, you have partial resetting, it's not a total homogenization. Otherwise, you would have something like here, like all straight like here. But you can partially re-homogenize it. So basically, this is what gives you the scatter here. And we have some good samples that we have clear evidence that it has been re-homogenized, and they fall like right here. All right, I'd like to thank Jonathan for being a keynote speaker with a gift. Why I presume? Ooh. So, thank you.